Um, thank you all so much for coming here tonight, and um, thanks to the IPK for uh, helping put this event on and just hosting us. Um, my name is Maya Vinukor. I teach in the Department of Russian and Slavic Studies here at NYU. Um, and before we turn the floor over to the panel, uh, I just wanted to say a few words about the group that this is happening in the framework of, um, and that's the Working Group for the Global New Right. Um, which uh, we actually, so I and my co-organizer, Leif Weatherby, who teaches in German here, um, convened just a few months ago, and the purpose of the group was really to um, uh, lay aside some of our um, emotions and moral judgments uh, about <laughs> the global new right, um, and just investigate their intellectual underpinnings, and really try to understand, using the tools that we use in our research as academics, um, kind of where they come from, um, where they get off using terms like cultural Marxism, um, and just generally how they interrelate to each other and just try to create a map um, for ourselves and for other people. Um, and uh, we are very excited to be uh, hosting this event, which is the first one that our group has put on here. Uh, and I'm going to uh, uh, turn the floor now over to Leif, who will in turn introduce AJ. Great. Thanks, Maya. Sure. Um, so uh, our host tonight is a member of the working group, A.J. Bauer, who is a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication here at NYU, and a fellow at the Tau Center, Tau Center? for Digital Journalism at Columbia University. He's the co-editor of the volume News on the Right, studying conservative news cultures, which came out with Oxford last year, and his work has appeared in American Journalism, uh, Columbia Journalism Review, The Guardian, TV Guide, and elsewhere. He's working on a highly relevant book called Making the Liberal Media, which examines the role of media criticism in the rise of the modern conservative movement in the United States. So I'm going to turn the mic over to AJ now. Um, thanks, Leif Maya. Thanks, everybody, for, for uh, turning out tonight. This is a great crowd. Um, so just a couple of uh, start, start of uh, rules of business or whatever the word is. Um, all of you have cards, or there are cards circulating. Um, a little bit later, we'll be uh, passing those cards around if anybody has any questions, right? Questions for our panelists. Uh, write your questions down. Um, we've got pens that are circulating as well. Um, and uh, that's how we'll be collecting the Q&A for this evening. So um, just a heads up, a little bit later on, I'll say pass the cards down, and we'll participate that way. Um, so I am delighted to introduce um, three folks here who uh, I am really excited to see in real life. Uh, I feel like I know them all from their uh, Twitter uh, personas, but I'll introduce them to you. Uh, you all probably know them very well already. Um, so here we have um, Hannah Geis, uh, who is a senior research analyst at the Southern Poverty Law Center, where she focuses broadly on white nationalism and white supremacy. She's a journalist with bylines at Splinter, New Republic, Jewish Currents, and is a frequent contributor to The Baffler. Um, she's a recent grad of the Harvard Divinity School. She earned her Master of the uh, Theological Studies last year, fo focusing on nationalism and Eastern Orthodoxy in late and post-Soviet Russia. Um, also keep an uh, eye out uh, in the coming weeks. I think you've got another project hitting soon, which will be exciting. No, no disclosure yet, but keep an eye out for the next week. Um, next we have Noor al Sebai, a journalist, critic, and social manager. Uh, they've worked at Truth Dig, Raw Story, and Bustle, writing and researching stories about hate groups, feminism, uh, police brutality, electoral politics, cultural criticism, and everything in between. Their book, MySpace Scene Queens, is forthcoming pending a few more uh, Kickstarter donations, I think, is ongoing. So uh, from Instar Books as part of its uh, Remember the Internet series. So if anybody wants to support that project, you just Google Kickstarter, Instar, uh, and remember the internet, and it will come up. I've, I tried the Google earlier, it works, so. Um, and last uh, but not least, we've got Talia Levin, uh, who's a writer and researcher based in Brooklyn. Her book, Culture Warlords, uh, is forthcoming from Hatchet later this year and focuses on the online far right. Uh, she's uh, also the creator of Moby Dick Energy, a podcast uh, breaking down the greatest and weirdest American novel. Highly recommended. Um, so. Thank you all for joining us, like I said. Um, the way that this will start out is I'll ask a few questions um, of our uh, esteemed panelists. We'll talk for a while, um, and then you all will have your say via the cards. So um, thanks again, and welcome to our, our panelists. It feels more like a game show that way, so thanks for, 
uh, edifying me. So just to start out, y'all, um, let's start out by having each of you kind of narrate your personal journey into this line of work. So how long have you been on the far right beat, as it were? Um, what did you do before, and how did you come to specialize in this particular topic? And we can just go down the road. Cool. Oh. All right. Um, I got interested in, I guess, what we would call the alt-right uh, around the time of Trump's election. Um, started covering the National Policy Institute. Went to a couple of their events um, undercover, although poorly undercover. Uh, and I mean, it, it fascinated me. I have an academic background in nationalism um, and religion, and it seemed like a really bizarre movement that was popping up and the way it was using the internet and the way it was using media and manipulating media to draw attention to itself uh, fascinated me. And yeah, and then I went to grad school and then I went to the SPLC. That's kind of about it, honestly. Hi. Um, so I, I would say that I really began doing this work um, around when Trump was a Senate, actually before the election, and a super fun fact about me is that I was so afraid of him that I voted for Ted Cruz in the North Carolina primaries because I was unregistered. It was sick, and I felt gross about it, but, uh, but it was around that election. Um, I remember reading a lot about a lot of white supremacists marauding around <laughs> the country, telling my dad's family not to go to the mosque, things like that. Um, that I really began focusing on it, and I began doing that work a lot more um, the day of the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally, which also happened to be the day that I moved to Tallahassee, Florida, uh, which was kind of a hotbed for all of that. Um, and it kind of dovetailed with the work I'd been doing previously on the police brutality beat, um, as it were. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm Jewish and um, not interested in replacing anyone. <laughs> so that's I don't know yeah I mean uh, I got my start in Jewish media like I was my first job in media was at a Jewish uh, newswire and the anti-semitism in our comments and the fact that Stormfront was often our biggest traffic driver was an early sign but it was after Charlottesville that was really galvanizing and I first wrote my article about uh, the web host of the Daily Stormer so that was my first foray into the beat Thank you. Um, so the next question I've got is, um, if you want, or if you could, um, and you've already gotten into this a little bit, um, kind of narrating your own kind of uh, political awakenings. So were you always interested in doing advocacy type journalism, or did you go through an objectivity phase? Um, where, how, did we, uh, how did we go in terms of journalism? Um, I guess it also ties a bit into the next question, but uh, I've never really seen that much of a difference between, especially on this beat, uh, difference between advocacy journalism and objective journalism. In fact, I think the idea of, that a lot of news organizations put out about something being objective ends up being a little bit too focused on both sides of them. So, I mean, there's a difference between reaching out to someone for comment, which obviously you have to do, and giving someone a platform to just spew their ideas without any kind of pushback. Um, and I guess one, one thing for me, was especially during... 2016 was seeing a lot of people really engage in this sort of both sides of them, especially when dealing with someone like Richard Spencer or dealing with uh, Jared Taylor at American Renaissance, some of these like relatively prominent intellectual white nationalists who knew how to push back. Um, so I guess that was probably personal awakening on that front. But yeah, I don't. I would I would say it was I'm objective and that those both go together. Um, I feel like saying on the record that I have never been an objective journalist. <laughs> I don't believe anyone who knows my work would. Yeah, yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, so yeah, never been an objective journalist. Um, even when I was in J school, I went to state school and like these ladies. Um, I was, I, I began my career doing feminist journalism, feminist blogging, like a lot of people. And, um, yeah, so I have, I, I began my career in sort of what in feminism they call viewpoint journalism um, or viewpoint writing. And, um, but, I mean, as far as political awakenings go or as far as, like, realizing I didn't want to be objective, that's just been 
most of my career, whether it's been writing about stuff that's important to parts of my identity related to queerness, related to body politics, or related to international stuff, or obviously um, related to white supremacy. Um, yeah, no, uh, objectivity, and I, we will get into more of this later, but objectivity, I believe, is a myth and a fallacy, especially in times like these. I mean, yeah, objectivity is just the myth that centrism as practiced by white men isn't an ideology or a perspective. Um, I mostly wrote personal essays about soup before Trump was elected. Um, so you could say that I felt some intense urgency a bit late, <laughs> but yeah. Right, so I, I, obviously the, the 2016 election was a pretty pivotal moment, it sounds like, um, and, and kind of a life-changing one for many of us. Um, so there are some, um, there's been some movement lately, both on the left and the right. So on the right, I'm thinking of, there's a Breitbart reporter named uh, Matt Boyle who are, kind of articulates a, a, what I've called at least kind of a radical subjectivity, right? And so his belief is that one's own political ideology, or ideological perspective that you should be reporting based upon that perspective, like a view from that place, um, and then let the audience determine kind of what the truths are, right? Using like authenticity as kind of a, a, a lens there. Um, on, the, on the left, you have folks like, say, Lewis Wallace, right, who's advocating for kind of a view from somewhere, right, as opposed to a view from nowhere, um, the kind of objectivity myth. Um, what are the kind of stakes for progressives, um, especially in this kind of Trump era and this kind of rise of, of global fascism beyond the U.S.? Uh, what are the stakes in terms of the objectivity debates for, for progressive journalists, do we think? Well, yeah. Um, I think one of the one of the biggest issues is find, finding a way to really narrate these movements without, I mean, basically without um, coming out, basically without uh, giving them too much of a platform, and then also just uh, I forgot where I was going with this. Um, but yeah, I mean. I, I think the biggest the biggest stake is being able to figure out that we can actually cover this. We should actually be covering this, um, and we need ways to cover it without getting into this fight that I think especially happened early on around 2016, 2017 of no, you shouldn't be covering this. It's not important. Versus the oh, we have to cover every bit of this. So whether when, whenever Richard, like Richard Spencer says, I don't support the war in Iran, something like that. You don't need to be covering that uh, versus you should be covering what they don't want you to be paying attention to. And especially for progressives, I think the big part of that ends up being movement building. Because um, these, these both sort of dovetail. By looking at the movements that you're seeking to effectively get rid of um, and kind of break down, to do so, you have to understand it, and to understand it, you have to be doing that in a way that's constructive. Um, yeah. Um, I agree really wholeheartedly with that. Um, and, and we both, I, I feel like we, we all have had pushback over the years, both that we don't need to be covering this stuff at all. I definitely have had editors tell me that this stuff is important. Not every white guy is a Nazi. Literally, I've had an editor tell me that. And um, and so there's that, and there's also there's a lot of people on the beat who do want to cover everything. Um, so it's it's more to make to to keep this stuff in the news, to keep these people in the news, um, because obviously there's a lot of circus-like things happening in Washington where um, I work and live now. But that we we still have to. There's still fights going on that are really important and I think that's probably the biggest stake for anyone who's watching and reporting on this work. I mean, so, and this is a little off question, we'll come back to the lines in a second. Um, so there's kind of a tension here, right, between kind of the circus of the right, right? That it's outlandish, it's zany, it's strange, like um, it, it mixes a bunch of different theories and aesthetic forms in ways that are peculiar, that draw attention like you say, maybe drawing attention to aspects that they kind of want to promote in some ways. Um, to what extent is that kind of um, the, the spotlight that gets targeted as a result of the kind of weirdness of the right, right? Um, to, to what extent do you, or how do you navigate that kind of like the, 
I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm speaking for myself, but as somebody who also studies the right, there, there's some kind of perverse pleasure sometimes, right, in covering these kind of peculiar movements that are mixing things together. Um, and so how do you balance that kind of perver perversion, <laughs> right, uh, with, um, with trying to do what you're talking about, right, making sure that you're reporting on aspects of it that are not amplifying, that are trying to, um, you know, cover it in a way that's productive? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess one of the conversations that we have a lot is, and we've had recently with... Um, I hope no one knows what this is, but the Griper War? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> don't, don't Google it. <laughs> please, please, for the love of God, do not Google oh. this. Um, but I, one of the conversations we have is, like, why do we want to cover this? What's the point in covering this? Um, who, the people who would say, especially somewhere like coming from SPLC, like, oh, great, they're scared of us now. Um, what, what's the added benefit there? Uh, and specifically because the Groyper War, which again, do not Google, um, started basically right when I actually started at SPLC. That's been one of the constant examples. Um, and that's just like truly circus-like. Essentially, to give a gist of it, it's basically there's some conservatives who aren't racist enough, and then there's a segment of conservatives who want the not racist enough conservatives to be more racist. So they've been showing up at events with conservatives who aren't racist enough, and then just kind of yelling at them, and then broadcasting all of this on places like Telegram, Twitter, etc. And, and Groyper, so you don't have to Google it, actually, is just basically like a different look version of Pepe the Pepe. Frog. It's just kind of like a, a different shaped Pepe. Which also don't Google that. Also don't Google that. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually, I, we, we do get into this a little bit later. Um, there is a lot of circus-like aspects of it. The, there was a group that broke down um, in a night that some refer to as the night of the wrong wives. People were sleeping with each other's wives. It's the tr traditional workers' party. It was pretty <laughs> funny, but also insane because they're Nazis. Um, there's a lot that's very circus-like about it, and I, I think, and we, and this is a question later, I think the scariest part and the part that it's easy to forget is that these people are people, and there's a lot of really normal aspects of it. There's a lot of... A lot of this stuff is like mirrored on the left in some ways. There's, and, and that's a kind of controversial thing to say, I feel. But um, there's a lot of infighting. There's a lot of groups breaking down and having offshoots um, that we definitely monitor, um, but is not necessarily worth publicizing. Um, and so that's that's a really that's a really difficult task and one that I I know I'm still learning to do and I think a lot of us are still learning to do but um, yeah keeping a, the eye on the prize the prize being ending fascism um, is is a difficult task but one that I try to keep in mind. I mean, you just want to make sure your coverage is pissing them off. <laughs> no, like I I know journalists who cover people who are on the far right and the far writers are excited to share their articles and I never want to be that person. I mean, being a Jewish woman puts some advantages in my court, but uh, yeah, no, you just want to make sure they're red mad and upset and probably going to lose a job. You want to make it hurt when you cover them and that's hard and it's not always easy and some of what I do is just you know, I get to write a lot about the far right for GQ, and, and, and what I do is then just try to illustrate the stakes of it all to a national audience, and, and that's part of what we do as well. Just like these people want to kill everyone that looks like me, and, and there's no quarter to be had or no marketplace of ideas that you can, you can't, you know, they're peddling poison. There's no acceptable amount of gas, poison gas in your bedroom. There's no acceptable amount of Nazism in your national discourse, and that's you know, I, I try to keep a pretty hard anti-fascist line in, in what I write, and that, uh, that kind of uncompromising idealism as a starting point helps. Great, thanks to all of y'all. Um, so for the, I know there's some, some undergraduates in the audience, um, maybe some aspiring reporters perhaps. Um, what does kind of a typical day look like? Um, how do you go about determining uh, what stories to cover or not cover on a, on a day or weekly basis? Um, and what are some methods for sourcing that y'all use? How do you go about doing the actual job of reporting? Well, uh, sorry, 
Um, I'm just really nervous, so I thought I'd get the talking out of the way. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, Hannah. <laughs> no, I. Uh, okay. uh, <laughs> no, I. I, I think um, by virtue of sort of mm, co coming pre-known as you know whatever, like I'm the first Google search result for greasy kike, which was always my dream growing up. Um, I do a lot of backdoor stuff, infiltration, telegram chats, uh, you know, um, just uh, open source intelligence kind of reporting and then aggregating others reporting and trying to put a new spin on it. Um, but yeah, an average day involves seeing like a lot more Holocaust memes than I ever thought w would be true when I set out as a starry eyed intern at the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. Um, but yeah, you know, for anyone starting out in the business, good luck. Um, uh, be sure you know how to weather a death threat or 20 uh, or 200. And uh, try to talk to the rank and file if you can. Don't just talk to the seasoned media representatives. You know, they're good at snow jobbing. That's what they do. Um, you know, anyone you talk to who isn't press trained, that's a bonus in your court. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting because a lot of, uh, my colleagues like Talia and, and Hannah and others are very, do, do go on Gab, which is like the far right's big social media site and, and Discord, which is supposed to be a gamer chat place, but is just where a lot of Nazis gather and stuff. Um, and I, I certainly am on those sites, but a lot of the stories that I do, uh, and so much of which is media criticism, criticism tends to come from Twitter um, and and also from what are what my colleagues are talking about um, so if there's something big happening um, obviously there are large stories that there are unreported things going on um, for instance I actually haven't been able to like place this in anywhere but um, the base which is that group that um, was planning to attack at the Richmond gun rally at the end of January. Um, they had their telegram taken over by, it appears, some anti-fascists, and that didn't, as far as I know, become a standalone story, and that was a pretty big deal. Um, so there's, there's things like that that are talked about that don't get reported, and those are the stories that I tend to try to go, go towards. Um, and as far as advice for young journalists, I think you have to really, really, really want it, regardless of what your beat is obviously there are lots and lots of things to cover um, and you have to be willing to get laid off a bunch of times um, which really sucks but is is a reality um, and beyond that and and be willing to be really broke and or write for a lot of really slimy um, people copywriting wise but yeah <laughs> I guess technically I left media um, <laughs> um, but I was at the Baffler for a while as our social media person. Um, I, I guess, but step one, join a unionized workplace. Uh, but in terms of day to day for me, it's mostly, there's a lot of monitoring. Uh, I think one of the things that happens when you start working on a place like SPLC, maybe ADL, some of these other kind of more think tanky, um, advocacy organizations focused on the far right is you end up doing a lot more like very intense source work. Um, you end up basically, I think in some capacity, un acting as an unofficial social worker at times, uh, which is someone who never really expected to act as a social worker just by going to divinity school. Um, yeah, it, it, it can be a bit jarring. Uh, and yeah, my my advice though would not to be go into not to go into media, <laughs> or if you do uh, have a stable job and like focus on freelancing, building up that way. Have very rich parents. That too. That that's helps. Awesome. That's that's slight, that that's harder to change, I guess. Um, so well, you're, you guys are in the lottery. yeah, <laughs> win the lottery. Um, Step, step one is join a unionized workplace, but step two is organize your workplace if it isn't unionized, yeah. right? And so that's always a, always an option to put out there, though, um, for sure. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, thank you all. So.
I'm going to ask you a question that I get all the time that I really hate, and I'm sorry, but um, I'll ask it so that folks don't ask it perhaps in the, in the Q&A, which is, um, how do you stomach day in and day out researching and reporting on, on the far right? Like, what do you do? Like, we talked, I guess we joked a little bit, or not joked, we talked real about this earlier, about the toll that it takes, right? And, and um, I guess I, was, I wanted to give you all the option or opportunity to kind of speak to that, right? Like, what, both what is that toll, um, to, to the extent we can put it into words, and then also what do we, how do we cope, right? Uh, yeah, I think um, one of the more, so I, I wrote a book about white supremacy, it handed in the manuscript a couple months ago, and I'm working on edits now, and like, I would say, mm, this is an anecdote I include in the book, but I was sort of eavesdropping on a Telegram chat about Nazis, and, uh, about, uh, sorry, not about, it was Nazis that were <laughs> talking, and they were talking about um, having sex with Jewish women, and specifically whether it was cool to it was like okay to rape a Jewish woman in like uh, you know in the context like in the context of racial purity or whatever. Um, and then uh, all of a sudden, someone said they didn't know I was eavesdropping. I had a sock puppet with a male name, whatever. All of a sudden someone said, um, would anyone rape Talia Lavin? And then they brought up some pictures of me, including a picture I'd posted like a year earlier of my feet, um, and, <laughs> and, and decided that I was too ugly to rape. They would only rape me with a gun, uh, and then um, decided that maybe r raping me with a gun would be a waste of, you know, a gun, and why not just kill me? Um, and so this was like four in the morning. I was like, oh my God, why did I check my phone? <laughs> it was very surreal. You know, I think you can't look into the abyss without the abyss looking at your feet. Um, and so, you know, and I think specifically as women uh, and, you know, non-binary people who cover the far right, um, I'm very grateful that we do have this panel because I think for a lot of our male colleagues, especially our white male colleagues who do make up the vast majority of people on this beat, there is a sense sometimes of like a Batman and the Joker or like kind of vibe where it's like you're a worthy adversary and that just doesn't exist when you're a woman um it's like you're an aberration you're disgusting um you know they're virulently misogynistic and uh you know um so i've i've gotten used to, there's like a, an anti-semitic caricature of me that like now has been passed around on the web and i like periodically see as a twitter reply for me for example um i post about moby dick a lot and then they just like post a bikini picture I posted five years ago and they're like, what kind of whale is this? And, and I'm like, a gorgeous one, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's just like, so there's the, the personal attacks and there's the, the sort of psychic toll of like reading this horror day in and day out. And like, like, how do I stay sane? Like, do you see how nervous I am on stage right now? Like, I don't, I don't, th I mean, I think that like there's kind of this machismo that you are, that like is very common in the journalistic profession of like, oh, death threats, it's fine, it's just my job, don't worry about it, I'm great. Um, and in fact, no, like it does take a psychic toll and it fucks with you and like it's okay to admit that. Um, and um, also, I play a lot of video games and masturbate. Um. That's kudos to that. That's the best. That really is the best way to deal with all of this. Um, for me, it's dancing, but uh, and masturbation, of course. But um, I, I'm unique among this panel, I think, because I fly under the radar way more than uh, both the women uh, beside me, which is uh, has been a really good thing, even though it can be like frustrating career-wise, not getting recognized or whatever. Um, so I, it's, it's a luxury for me. So I, I mean, I've obviously gotten the death threats and I had to learn how to be really savvy, especially, uh, especially when I was living in Tallahassee, but also when I was living in New York. Um, just not, you know, not saying where, where I lived, basically not identifying anything. Um, so, so that's, that's a toll that, just sort of personal safety all, all the time, even when it's not like when I'm not working, when I'm just like talking shit on the internet about whatever sort of thing I'm doing. Um, that was an unexpected personal toll. And 
And another, but another luxury that I have that a lot of my colleagues don't have is uh, because it's because I've been employed full time doing a lot of this kind of work. I get to log off at the end of the day, and and I often, obviously, you will see anyone who is talk who talks about the toll this takes online saying, you'll you'll see people replying saying, why don't you just go offline? Um, and that's a really hard thing to do <laughs> when so many when so much of our job is online and the only reason I'm able to do that is because it's my day job. So at the end of the day I can put my phone away and watch five episodes of The Sopranos or whatever and then um <laughs> get along go along with my life. Um but yeah, also um just like doing stuff to get out of my head like going out dancing and going and doing fun shit like that, trying to have fun. Uh, I pet our cat. <laughs> that's I, that's that, yeah. Um, <laughs> but in all seriousness, uh, it's, I mean, it's hard. Um, I, I guess I was a bit of a tw Twitter troll for professionally for two years, so it, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't really bother me. Um, but I remember the first time I first big article I did on the alt-right, I got picked up by Newsweek and my mom, my mom, um, <laughs> broke the old rule that you should never read the comments <laughs> and read the comments. I, I did not read the comments, to be clear. Um, and this was back, I think Newsweek was using Discuss or some like platform like that, where basically anyone could log in through their Facebook and then just post crap. And it being Newsweek back in the day, like there were like 800 comments of angry Trump supporting white dudes being like, "What? Look at all! Look at this! These people just calling us racist." Which actually wasn't the point of the article, so I'm not really convinced they read it. Um, that usually happens. Uh, but yeah, a lot of it's just like learning how to tune out. That was did, focused a fair bit on the on white nationalism during grad school. And one thing I, my therapist told me to do was, uh, despite the fact that you have grad student hours of like waking up at 11 and going to sleep at like 4 a.m., um, you should not be on Stormfront at 3 a.m. when you have class the next day uh, for research purposes. Um, and she was right. You do have to tune out and find out what works for you. Um, another another thing about that I think is kind of already evident in the way that y'all answer the question is that um, you're all w like wickedly funny, like extremely funny, like um, and I guess I want like do you do you think much about humor um, and its role in your work or is it is it because. I also like if I'm anxious or something like I also like make try to make jokes or something like that because it, it is a coping mechanism in some ways. But I wonder like have y'all theorized your own humor or like why you laugh or what you laugh at um, or like what work joke do, joke, humor does for you in your journalism or in your online life? Um, well, physically, I kind of look like a trash bag full of noodle pudding in a wig. So humor has been a defense mechanism of mine for a very long time. Um, but when it comes to Wow, that killed it. Um, <laughs> damn. Um, anyway, um, when it comes to Nazis, I mean, for one thing, it's like a pretty powerful tool against them. There's this total um, B word, by which I mean Baltic woman, uh, named Lana Lochteff, who's one of the co-hosts of Red Ice TV. It's like a white nationalist outlet that's been successively banned from more and more sites as I cackle with glee. Um, anyway, she and I got into a beef because uh, I was like, hey, it's kind of fucked up that you are have this giant platform on YouTube and are producing videos of being like, white women are being forced into interracial marriage. And I kind of did a Twitter thread and then, you know, a, 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 a Media Matters article about it. And she found this the one time I ever went to the beach, I went to Brighton Beach, and I posted a picture in a bikini, and anyway, she was like, she found it, was like, what more do I have to say? And she's this, like, very, she looks kind of like, I say Baltic because she looks like she runs a Lithuanian orphanage and is not kind to the orphans. Like, she is, is very severe looking. And I just wrote, like, in response, like, 
wow, you exposed your followers to like some luscious Jewish titties. Just, just luscious. And I just kept writing the phrase luscious Jewish titties until she blocked me. Um, she blocked me. Like I out trolled literal neo-Nazi. They did a, they did a video later speculating that I'd changed my name from Levin to sound less Jewish, in which case I've, I'm an abject failure. Um, and like that, I looked like a whale and all this stuff. But I was like, clearly I've gotten into your head. And so just the ability to take what they think is this grievous and devastating blow and respond with a joke, I think, is its own form of power. Um, and, you know, when you uh, when you don't have other forms of social power, like um, it can be a really powerful tool in an arsenal. And I'm. Uh, I'm of the opinion that punching at a Nazi is always punching up, you know, comedy-wise. Um, I actually have a somewhat similar story, although it's from long before I started doing this work. Back when I was running this website uh, called Fem Inspired that shut down because the guy who was the money guy was harassing women on a Harry Potter podcast. Um, <laughs> There, I wrote an article, I, I used to write a lot about uh, like body positivity stuff, and um, I wrote an article like about wearing crop tops back when those were a thing, and people were like, fat girls can't wear those, and I was like, fuck that. So I wrote about it, and I was in college and on Tumblr, so I included a photo of myself, but, which was, as we have learned, a bad idea on the internet. Um, and it, some guys on... The Roosh V forum found it. Not Roosh V himself, I'm not that important, but, um, and they started talking about it. They were like, look at this screed. She talks about being death fat, which is a different term, not even what I said I was. And then it just devolved into these guys, like they were talking about my writing for a little bit, and then it just devolved into these guys talking about whether or not they'd fuck me, which was really <laughs> weird. Um, and, and it was it was especially hilarious because these are pickup artists and they're talking about rating me and stuff. And at the time, that was really, really hilarious. And sometimes when I the, this work really upsets me, I will go back and read that thread because it, it's just so humorous. And they're like... It ended up guys started commenting various gross and also mean stuff in other languages. The only one that freaked me out was in Arabic. I was like, please let this not be one of my relatives. It wasn't. Uh, he was in Morocco. And, um, and so it's, I, I remember the moment like when I first saw that and I was just like, this is so, like, I was like, this is disgusting. And I was crying and I was like, this is really freaky. And then like, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And the more I thought about it, the more hilarious it was. I was just like, these guys really, these guys really like see me and see women and see the world like this. And uh, as I wasn't really involved in the Gamergate world, which is a very fraught thing now, but um, a lot of those guys uh, ended up being like, ended up becoming what we used to call the alt-right. And, um, that that really dovetailed. So it's the same tactics they use. They use all the same stuff, like making fun of and or objectifying women's bodies, usually both. And all we can do is laugh at them because, I mean, we can also, you know, theoretically, and I, I'm against violence, punch them. But <laughs> um, beyond that, that's like Talia said, our biggest weapon. I, t I tend to, yeah. I mean. There, the thing about an internet subculture is that there's some stuff also that's legitimately kind of funny that you end up stumbling upon. Um, and it, it will just be like bizarre manifestations of like Pepe the Frog that just escalated to new levels of ridiculousness. So Pepe was this image that basically originated on 4chan, got picked up on 8chan, and they were making all these like different, there would be rare Pepe's where they would, you'd find a rare Pepe, it would be like Pepe dre dressed as like Himmler or something. Um, yeah. Um, but some of it, especially some of the personal attacks, like you just kind of have to laugh at them. I remember, I, th I think it was the week before I started at SPLC, uh, a white nationalists who will remain unnamed emailed me to ask for comment about an article that he was writing about me. And 
the email itself kind of sounded like he actually, I'm sure he didn't have anything serious and also like there's not really anything he put out there that would be like particularly damning. Sorry, I'm kind of boring. Um, but it was, I remember eventually seeing the article and it was just, he seemed to be implying that I lived in a large Manhattan apartment with a ton of cats. Um, <laughs> that sounds awesome. I, I wish I lived in a large Manhattan apartment with a ton of cats, and I think my partner would too. Um, and that is not true. Uh, but, yeah, you, you just kind of pick out the stuff that's funny, and you just you laugh at it because, yeah, it is a way to disengage it. And I know a lot of my colleagues do that too. They're, some of them aren't public, so it's like a lot of the stuff that ends up being posted on the, about, on the Internet isn't necessarily specifically directed at you, even by name, even though it will possibly be about you. Um, so we've been talking about the Internet. We've been talking about Twitter. Um, so part of the reason that I know about all of your work is just because I, I see all of you on Twitter, right? And I think that you're all part of kind of a, a pretty tight-knit group, I would say, at least online. I don't know. I can't presume for offline. But um, many of the folks that I, I see and, and kind of follow online, are, are many of them are women, queer folk, other folks who are like in especially vulnerable positions like vis-a-vis -vis, you know, white supremacist patriarchy Nazis, basically, right? Um, and so how did you come to know one another and kind of how did that community on Twitter kind of form? Um, and what role does Twitter and these kind of online spaces play in kind of bolstering your work? Like, um, especially given the kind of vulnerabilities that, that you face in doing that work. Well, I mean, as Homer Simpson said about alcohol, um, Twitter is sort of the cause of and solution to all my life's problems. Like, it's, um, I had a very public incident um, in 2018 where I like very briefly like um, uh, an employee of Immigration and Customs Enforcement like they posted an ad for how awesome ICE is um, and the guy like in the picture had an elbow tattoo and I kind of tweeted basically just like an image of the tattoo like an image, an image of the ad a close up of the tattoo and then like sort of a uh, definition of an iron cross because it looked like an iron cross to me and that like not always but sometimes has associations with white supremacy and then I deleted the tweet 15 minutes later and um, a couple of people had suggested oh it looks more like a Maltese cross so I wrote sorry this is a Maltese cross and uh, you know like um, forget you know like it, and not uh, an iron cross associated with white supremacy and so but like <laughs> The next day, I think because I had I had a New Yorker union, we were like unionizing at the New Yorker. I was a fact checker at the New Yorker, um, and we were unionizing. And I had like a New Yorker union kind of image as my Twitter avatar. Um, Ice, the government agency with several million followers, like put out a press release about me, erroneously saying that I was the source of the rumor, demanding that I apologize and that my employer apologize. And now. Um, I don't know if you've watched Olympic discus events. Um, they're good at throwing, but but employers, corporate employers, throwing you under the bus way better, faster. Um, and um, it was really interesting to watch myself uh, become the subject of first first a National Review article, and then all the way down the conservative food chain to the Daily Stormer, um, which I loved revisiting me. Um, and so. Uh, like ever since then, I've been this sort of perennial um, character on the right in like weird ways. Like there'll be like a New York Post article about like me tweeting about like the, that like Dan, Dan Crenshaw is a shithead. Like and it's like Talia Lavin once again spurs with leading conservatives. I'm like, who? Why would anyone know who I am? Anyway, the point is I'm a, a big loudmouth on Twitter. Um, and I have been for a while, and it's like, as a freelancer, that's how editors know who I am. I, like, I have about 100,000 followers at this point, and so that's like a powerful, you know, way to boost yourself. It's, it's, a, it's a way, reason editors are asking you to write for them, or, or, or to pitch, or to be a columnist, or whatever. 
at the same time, it's a massive locus of harassment. Like, of course it is, you know? And, like, uh, uh, because by virtue of having a megaphone like that, I mean, crazy shit has happened. Like, uh, you know, my parents got, like, a card that said blood and soil in the mail to their house. Um, like, someone's doxed my entire family on Gab. Like, um, uh, you know, I've gone back and, like, scrubbed. Anyway, sorry, this is really wandering off the point of the question. But, the, but, but like... When you have this degree of vitriol, when you have this degree of misogyny, when you have this degree of, like, loathing of feminism, loathing of queerness, like, you have to find people who get it. And, like, with all due respect to our white male colleagues, like, they just don't. Like, they will never experience the level of vitriol that we do, and and, and never in the same way. And so we had to find one another, because it's, like, it's clinging, it's clinging to each other in, in, a, in, in a sea of aqua regia. I mean which is a particularly vitriolic type of acid I, that I looked up for a metaphor once. Um, yeah, I mean, just being able to, like, talk to people. I mean, we, I, we have a colleague who um, a Nazi got particularly fixated on her, and um, this all happened on a public telegram channel, so I feel like I can talk about it. Like, he um, named a deer that he was hunting in the woods her name, and then killed the deer and took photos of himself flaying and crucifying the deer that he had named after her um, on his Telegram channel. And, like, that's about as clear as possible a signal to his thousands of followers that she should be found and murdered and tortured. And so, and that just hasn't happened, even to the most, um, you know, amazing and, 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 uh, enterprising and like Nazi busting of our male colleagues because again there's the sense of like Batman and the Joker you know you're a worthy adversary um, that just doesn't exist for us and so we, we cling to each other because we have no other choice otherwise you'll go crazy um, yeah I mean it's Twitter is is really just like a huge blessing and a curse for media in general um, but I think especially on a beat like ours that's very um, high risk, I think you could call it. Um, it's it's really, it's a great source of networking. And it's, I, I actually, when I was going over my remarks for this, I was like, should I call it networking? Like, what if they find out about it? They're like, they have these networks. But <laughs> all professions have networks. Um, and and so, like, that's, it, it is. It, I mean, like, a lot of us have helped each other get jobs, helped each other place place articles um, in other places, and also just, like, helped each other through, like, really difficult times, obviously helped each other, like, it's, it's a really powerful form of organizing. I mean, even when you go back to the Arab Spring, obviously Twitter was the locus of the Arab Spring. And, um, and so it's just, it's a really, it's a really important tool for us, but also is even though Twitter says they're banning hate speech just like Facebook, is also the same place where they will find us and post memes about, like, you know, really disgusting shit that obviously has been mentioned many times here. Yeah, I mean, Twitter, I guess, has been good to me professionally, although ending up in the New York Times once for a tweet that I wrote at 2 a.m. Um, was a little strange. You can... Google that yourselves. Uh, but um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think find, you find your support networks, and those are important. Uh, but I think there also tends to be a tendency to think that just because Twitter is particularly important to the media, um, and I mean, partly just because the shift in digital media, that it, it tends to get this outsized importance. Um, that as anyone who's dealt with audience de development also knows to like in terms of traffic to your own articles twitter is crap uh it's really all coming from like mostly angry people on facebook uh that's there's been a bit of downturn in that but i mean it's been useful for, for boosting things it's useful for finding people but yeah i've been trying not to put as much i think stake in it as i used to um so Oh, is this mic not good? 
Is this mic better? Ooh, that mic is much better. I'm sorry about that. Um, so you all follow this stuff all day, every day, years, right? Um, what continues to surprise or shock you about the right and about the, the people that you cover, um, in spite of the fact that you see it all the time? Um, well, I think there's a big difference between being shocked or surprised and being appalled. Um, and while I may have lost my capacity for surprise to a large extent, my capacity for being appalled continues to amaze me. Um, I think that whenever you have communities organized purely around vitriol and hate, um, that this is the avenue of their creativity, this is where they put their energy and their passion, like, they're always going to be astoundingly horrific new, you know, um, new and delightful manifestations of, 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 of hatred. I will say one thing that uh, I really didn't like to see, you hated to see it, was uh, in the affidavit for the arrest of a couple of members of that neo-Nazi group, The Base, they had planned a targeted assassination of an anti-fascist couple. Targeted assassinations are new and concerning if you're, say, someone that they might know about. Um, so that wasn't awesome. Um, and, you know, I hope they abandon it swiftly. I don't know. That was surprising to me. Um, I, I touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but I, there's, especially when there's a lot of intel on the internal workings of these groups, because, I mean, obviously both uh, um, Hannah and Talia have infiltrated these groups they're stupid easy to infiltrate because they're by and large like pretty dumb and not very secure uh with with the most violent groups uh, like being the most secure which is terrifying um but they it's because there's all this circus like stuff and there's all this really horrific stuff like the stuff with the base and i talk um and i've written a lot about this other group called adam waffen division that um, have been involved in a lot of really grisly murders, um, one of which involved a guy going to ISIS like Islam and then killing his roommates. Um, so there's like a lot of that sort of really headline grabbing stuff, but there's, but like I said earlier, there's a lot of it that's very normal. There's a lot of groups fracturing because of personal disagreements. A lot of those personal disagreements are about, are like groiper shit, like about like not being racist enough or not doing national socialism right or whatever but um but there's they're they're very normal and, it, and that's something that's surprising in a way that i have to wrap my mind around a lot because it's a lot harder i mean people who like go to war even um have that like when you see an enemy whatever an enemy may be as a person it's a lot harder to fight them and so these I think a lot of us know that these are not just like mythical monsters they're people and that makes them a lot more dangerous I think and a lot more terrifying but also a lot in some ways a lot more easy to write about to research to target in whatever ways uh, we do journalistically I guess it's basically between two things, um, and they're actually kind of different. Uh, the first one, and I mean, this isn't new to far-right movements per se, I mean, the, the KKK had like a cookbook for women, but um, basically why women are drawn to these very viciously misogynistic movements, and especially when you talk to some of them that are, have left or are in the process of leaving, because um, really it is like a process, it's a multi-year process, uh, hearing some of the stuff that they go through and some of the things that they have to listen to, whether it's from a partner or whether it's um, from friends, it's just really disgusting. And one thing that has kind of mind boggled me, and I wrote an article for, about this in the New Republic back in 2017, is like, just kind of why? Um, because there was a debate uh, roughly around 2017 within circles of like the white nationalism 2.0 or the alt-right uh, about what was the role of women. And it was partially led by women who 
I think some some of them wouldn't necessarily say this publicly, but were kind of sick of being cast aside and felt that they needed some kind of role. Um, the other thing that actually also continues to surprise me is just like how embedded uh, they've managed to become. I mean, if you look at something from our Miller reporting, um, we had a bunch of uh, reports on Stephen Miller and kind of his connection to the white nationalism world is how effective they've managed to be, uh, especially within kind of like the beltway white nationalist community of finding their way into conservative institutions. Um, piece I did on Splinter was focused on a man who a lot of people outside of DC media wouldn't outside of DC media wouldn't really know of, but he was the journalism director at the Institute for Humane Studies, which is one of the ma the biggest uh, I mean it's one of the bigger conservative institutions in DC. And he was on a list where he was sending out neo Nazi memes and like talking about Hitler as like our friend. Um, and it's it's just crazy to see that these guys managed to get this far without anyone really finding them out. And so, um, given that we're we're in an election year, although we can't seem to get that right yet, um, hypothetically, we could we could this time next year be you know under a, a Bernie administration, yay maybe, uh, or someone other other than Trump. Um, one thing that I, I've been thinking about a while, and I'm curious what y'all think about, is um, I feel a little bit torn um, in some ways that my own career, as somebody who studies the right and right-wing media, right, has somehow been tied to this con perverse moment, right, where, um, you know, when, Don, when, when Donald Trump got elected, I mean, I don't know, for those of you who weren't in New York, it was like a national mourning in New York. New York was full of people crying. It was very heavy. Um, and... Um, I remember talking with you know colleagues and people that were like, "Oh yes, yes, it's terrible, but hey, you're going to do good now, right? Your your work is really important now. It's really vital now, right?" And so um, uh, that's sickening to me, right? Obviously, and I, I think that. Um, I, but one of the benefits I think of the Trump administration, for all of its obvious horrors, is um, there is an increased interest, right, in coverage and focus on the right, right? I mean, the SPLC has been doing the work forever. Like, there's been a lot of smaller groups, um, the public research, or what is it, Pro uh, political research associates, right, Chip Roulette and, um, and them up in Boston. Um, so there have been these small groups that have been doing it forever and for a long time, right? But there's an intense focus where you've got, like, the New Yorker, GQ, all these other kind of bigger outlets that are actually paying attention. Um, what do we think happens after Trump, post-Trump, right? So even if he gets reelected, eventually he will die or leave or whatever, right? And so there will be a post-Trump. We can all believe that, right? Um, what happens then, right? I mean, is this a beat that y'all uh, feel like y'all want to continue into the future? Is it something that's kind of an emergency response in the moment? Um, what do we see going forward? Well, one of the luxuries of being a freelancer is that I can write about soup sometimes, still. Um, but, you know, uh, a lot of what I studied and studied for my book, which incidentally, I mean, this is very mercenary, but I told my publisher, like, it has to be out before the election. Because if Trump wins again, no one's going to want to read about this. And if uh, Trump loses, everyone's going to be like, oh, well, well, that's over. That national nightmare is done forever. Um, but in practice, um, which it won't be, <laughs> in practice, a lot of what I focused on, just by virtue of, like, who I am and my background is anti-Semitism. Um, and I've learned what an adaptive and useful parasite it is and how long it has endured. And I think that there are similar things to say about Islamophobia, about anti-black racism, about all these, um, about, you know, misogyny and all these other hates that sort of braid together into the hideous khala that is the alt-right. Um, and so I think that, um, I will never stop pursuing um, the dismantling of those structures. Um, I, I like to think so anyway. Um, you know, although I hope that there will come a time when it will feel less like the boot is on our collective throat and it will feel a little more academic and a little less life or death. Because right now, like, why, why I do it is, like, I have 
young relatives who are Jews and I want them to be safe and I think about them every day. Like, that's what I do. Why I do what I do, period. Um, I've, I, I work in political media and have for the majority of my career in any, um, in any sort of national publication. And I've long said and long argued with coworkers and even bosses to my detriment um, that this has never been about Trump. Trump has like been good at the, this, the Trump moment has been good at exposing white nationalism and the far right's tentacles and how deeply they're embedded into our political system. But it's, it's not about him. And when he was elected, there was, there were so many hate crimes. There was huge spikes in hate crimes. There obviously have been, there's been a major spike in anti-Semitic hate crimes in New York and over the past few years since Pittsburgh, especially. And I, I do fear that after Trump leaves office in whatever way, though it's not going to be um, <laughs> impeachment, uh, it, that he that people will stop caring. I mean, like I said, I police brutality was maybe before this, and people don't really care about that anymore. And I, that is white supremacist violence that is state sanctioned. So I I worry that. It, it will morph because we know it has morphed over the history of this country. And I, I do worry that people will just stop caring or that it will just be a thing of the past um, when I think everyone who works in this beat knows it will continue. I'm in a really awkward position because I focus both on Russia and on the far right. And I had been interested in both long before 2015. Actually, I think that's how I found the National Policy Institute website is I was looking for translations of a Russian new Eurasianist philosopher. Anyway, um, but yeah, it was really it's really awkward to be like, oh, everything matters now. And in fact, I, speaking for about Russia specifically, I kind of wish that people stopped caring the way that they are because it's really annoying to see a bunch of pictures of St. Basil's Cathedral and then it's just like somehow like Putin in the corner sinisterly looking over it and like somehow manipulating the White House. Um, there's a documentary poster that looked like that. It was really bad. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's here to stay. I think both of them are here to stay. Obviously, foreign in interference in elections are here to stay, but the sort of Russiagate grifters that you have coming from that, they're gonna go. Um, and obviously white supremacy, I, it's not going anywhere. In fact, I, maybe I'm really pessimistic and maybe I'm wrong, but I think it probably would, honestly, what we're seeing now will get worse if Trump isn't elected. Um, so we're getting close to, to the Q&A time, so if folks want to take up cards uh, and we can get, get that ball rolling. Um, so... Um, one 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 last question while we while we get the the ball rolling as it were here, um, how so in a, in kind of a post Trump still covering uh, you know white supremacy and patriarchy etc. Um, how does that how will that require a change of tactics right so we talked a little bit we didn't talk explicitly about like amplification which is one of the questions that I gave them but you all talked a little bit about it indirectly. Um, uh, your posi like how you feel about what you need to amplify or not amplify or, or tone down about a particular movement in your coverage of it, does that change um, if the public is kind of turning away? So like you mentioned with police brutality, it's perhaps less that people don't care or something, maybe it's just like nobody's got their eye on that ball at the moment, right? Um, and so what aspects of the far right do we need to keep our eye on and which aspects post-Trump can we like let, let go? Um, well, I think um, we will not have to wonder about their particular relationship with Trump anymore. I mean, that seems pretty obvious, but that's that relationship has changed a lot in like interesting ways um, over the last, you know, four years or whatever. And uh, so that part can recede. Um, I think like the question of white nationalism in the White House, well, knock on wood in the post-Trump era, you know, recede a bit um 
you know, in the same way, at least, this kind of like, oh, like people who are part of the organized white nationalist movement are also shaping immigration policy and like that seems bad. Um, uh, but, you know, the question of of hatred, of violence, of the idea of like fomenting race war and revolution and like using these media and uh, social media culture jamming tactics, like those won't go away. And so I think having the sort of veterans of the Trump era, um, people who are drawn to this beat, like it's only good to have more people with expertise. I mean, of course, there are also grifters in, in this space that have emerged um, self-declared experts. I say as if I'm not a self-declared expert, but like, you know what I mean? I, I don't know. Um, uh, uh, and, um, but I think... Yeah, I mean, hope again, just the question of like white nationalism in the White House hopefully will recede a bit, and then white nationalism everywhere else will remain. I do think it's worth mentioning that if the current Democratic frontrunner um, wins, we're going to see a really, really horrific uptick in anti-Semitic violence, um, and which is very, very scary. But that's... As far as tactics go, I think that a lot of I think we a lot of us have developed toolkits that are going that we're going to continue to use. It won't hopefully be a matter of White House policy, and especially um, it once Trump is out of office, I would like to hope that the next president will do some rooting out of that or whatever. But um, but I mean, the connections to Congress will not stop. The connections to the major DC think tanks won't stop. And so I, I think that it's not going to recede as much politically as it might seem on the surface. Yeah, I think one of the biggest shifts in priorities would probably be um, focusing on institutional issues. Um, and. I think there's been a lot of focus on the White House Trump movement, but like looking at the ways that kind of the reactionary right has managed to find its way into places like Silicon Valley or other areas, looking at money basically, um, which someone again with a divinity degree, I'm not very good at numbers. Um, but I think that's one of the big things. And I think also just paying attention to how these movements, especially if we have our first, if we somehow manage to have our first Jewish president, I mean, how they are manipulating the space and kind of if, what, what the movements tend to focus on because of like who's in power. Thanks. So uh, we have some questions from the audience. I'll just go through and read. Uh, I picked this one seems uh, kind of resonant in some ways or connected to what we've just been talking about, so I'll ask it. Um, how do you draw the line between what is alt-right or white supremacist specifically um, versus right-wing ideological uh, ideology more generally? So when uh, in the kind of framing of the, the panel when we're talking about the far right, right, what's the far right? How does that relate vis-a-vis -vis other aspects of the right? How do you all think about that? It's often very tricky to figure that out. Um, and I think that there are white nationalists and white supremacists who have used that to their advantage. And for example, infiltrating local GOP parties, um, as has been the case in Philadelphia and even to a degree in New York um, City. Uh, so the answer is that it's like not always that easy to differentiate. And also that in an era in which the presidency is so extreme, like the line is even blurrier. So that like, you know, close the borders, put people in concentration camps. Like, you know, these are mainstream right wing ideas now. Um, I do think like, you know, if someone is like a fiscal conservative or something, or like, I don't know, like, like they're, I mean, it's, I, I, like, I support single-payer health care, but I don't think everyone who wants a private insurer model is a Nazi. Um, uh, maybe a eugenicist a little, but... Um, no, it's tricky is the answer, and you have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule, especially these days. Um, I definitely agree that there's been a major 
Overton window shifting, which is some of the terminology we like to use on Twitter.com. Um, but it's it's interesting. Even even the term alt right is like one that if you were to say in certain groups of maybe even our colleagues, people would laugh at you because no one uses that term anymore. Um, it's and and there has there has been the rehabbing of the dapper white nationalist as happened with Richard Spencer before Charlottesville, um, and and these ideas are publicly accepted ideas. Um, but I think the line is really just how open they're willing to be with their racism. Um, I, it's my belief that the entire um, GOP and a lot of centrist Democrats who work closely with them on their, especially immigration and war policy, um, are much closer to what we would call white nationalism and even white supremacy than I think a lot of people want to admit. Um, so it's, it is a very tricky one, but there, there are a lot of tells, especially when they use terms like white genocide. That's probably the biggest tell. I mean, it is actually kind of hard, uh, um, I, I guess the simplest answer would be to say, look at what they're saying. Um, you can, I mean, there are certain code words that certain people in parts of the far right movement will use that signify cer certain things. Uh, the Great Replacement, I guess, is one that is essentially is kind of a more pseudo-intellectual version of white genocide. Um, but it's tricky. I mean, I do actually think that there is use still for using the term alt-right to specifically describe a part of the movement that did exist at a his historical time where they were using that term to essentially try and create a more like broader, inclusive, white nationalist, white supremacist movement, but it has to be defined as both of those. Um, so the next question is, um, how do you assess alt-right leaders' claims about the size and activity levels of their followings, um, or can you? Um, how do you go about trying to assess, for example, if this movement is growing or declining, other than kind of this connection to the Trump administration, for example, which is a clear, clear one? One metric I used for my book was like I joined about um, 90 like far right channels on Telegram and just like did the raw sort of adding up of how many people are in these groups, these channels. Um, it's really it's hard to quantify. And like in general, it's wise to take the words of like white nationalist representatives as bullshit until proven otherwise like they want to sca like seem scary and big and strong and you know ready to overturn the, our like the, the cultural marxist degenerates at any given moment so it is very hard to quantify um but i i think that especially when you think about the ways that it manifests like mass shootings, terror attacks, like raw numbers matter less than fanaticism within the ranks. Um, I couldn't agree more with that. And, and it's interesting because my, my knee jerk like response and metric would be to see just how many people showed up to Charlottesville, but they tried to organize one a year later and it had a fraction of the turnout because people were pushed back underground. Um, so it's, there are both like more and less of them, of these, of white supremacist aligned groups than I think a lot of people realize, even including those of us in the beat, depending on which corner of it we are. Um, and I do think that it's important to, to like holistically look at the effects of it going on Fox News every night uh, via Tucker Carlson, it, you know, being in the White House and also it resulting in both, both actual and planned terrorist attacks, as we saw with the base. It's a, it, yeah, I think it's almost impossible um, unless you're really embedded or infiltrated a group. But even so, I mean, to a certain extent, it almost doesn't matter. Um, I think in term, if you look at a group like Adam Waffen or kind of various splinters of Adam Waffen, like they're, it's been very small and it's actually, I, I guess by its own metrics of what it was trying to do, it has been in many ways very effective. 
Um, but there's actually a really interesting historical case uh, that, not to bring everything back to Russia, but um, in the late 1980s, there was a group called Pamyat, which means memorial. Um, and it was a far-right group that claimed to have, I looked at, forget which channel broadcasted this, but there was an old documentary that claimed it had some like million uh, members that is clearly bullshit. Um, and the news just kind of threw it out, like, oh yeah, there are like a million of these guys who all really believe that like some of these guys were kind of like borderline like pro-Hitler, um, which is a strange posi position to take when you live in Russia. Um, but, or like, yeah, the Russia part of the Soviet Union at that point. Um, but yeah, it, it's a hard question for us too, because I think like you, we will, when we're doing the count every year, like you are activating groups and you, I mean, some of them may be quite small and you do have to kind of think about like, what does it mean to draw attention to this group? Definitely. So last question, because we're, we're running low on time. Um, what do you think accounts for the affinity between gamers and far-right groups? Um, what accounts for this kind of overlap? Um, well, I think it's actually, um, that's a really it, like, it, like good note to end, maybe interesting note to end on at any rate. Um, but I think that one of the things that distinguishes the contemporary like far-right alt-right, whatever you want to call it, from earlier skinhead movements, from the Klan, is just how vicious it is in terms of its misogyny and how in many ways it's premised on misogyny. Like, sometimes people talk about misogyny as a gateway hate, and, like, I don't know how I feel about that term because misogyny is often lethal in and of itself, um, unlike, say, like, a gateway drug like marijuana. Um... But but I think there are ways in which gamers, people who are part of these all-male or like, like almost all-male uh, online subcultures can be drawn into the far right by means of misogyny. You know, because what you have essentially is people who are ready to buck a certain kind of so, like vaguely left-aligned social orthodoxy, which is that like, women are equal to men and should like make as much money and should have bodily autonomy. And then you have people who are ready to rage against that. And so they're in a pretty prime position to have someone whisper in their ear, by the way, you know, who invented feminism, the Jews, or, you know, what else is that they're like, they're lying to you about is, have you considered skull shapes and, phrenology and racial IQ. And so, yeah, so the, um, you know, so I, I think it's, 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 um, it's only a matter, uh, a certain matter of inches between being willing to harass women online because they are women and then, you know, pulling out the calipers, you know? Yeah. Like once you're questioning one set of orthodoxies, like you're in a prime position to have someone, Say like you know, hey, come come over here. I got a lot more of stuff that'll make you feel just as good. Um, yeah. Um, I think that really speaks to a lot of internet subcultures in general, um, and and that's there has been a lot of scholarship, a very disjointed scholarship on the types of gathering places online. Um, like to plug my book or whatever. There's there's some or not even my own, but um, one of the other books in the series is um, about how people how sex workers use Tumblr um, back in the day to organize with each other and to find work. Um, and so I think especially the internet as an organizing tool and as a meeting place is still so much more powerful than anyone is like ready to, or we can, I think even that we can wrap our minds around. Um, and, and there are, there have been, there have been special interest groups online since the internet became something that 
you know, multiple thousands of people had in their houses. And there have been music message boards where people ended up getting jobs. There's one um, very weirdly popular defunct group called Something Awful where they, uh, they continue to shape a lot of comedy today, things like that. Um, and especially the advent of gaming as a subculture has, I mean, even, even before it was online with D&D, like that, it has become a powerful subculture of its own. And, um, as such, it, there, there has become a set of ideals, um, mostly around misogyny, but a lot of, you know, a lot of even the stuff they talk about with beta males and shit like that, that does just have a core value and I'm losing my train of thought on that. But, um, but yeah, it's, I think just that these people are in the same places and there has been some scholarship on the, on the connections between the men's rights movement and gamers and, uh, what we would probably call Pepe Nazis. <laughs> Disaffected white bros. That's basically it. I mean, disaffected white bros who have access to a computer. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Everyone um, cheers and thank our, our panelists. Um, I believe we have some, some wine and some cheese and snacks and things if folks want to nosh. Otherwise, thank you all so much for coming. Um, take care.